So I'm here to talk about tracking fish, particularly with telemetry, and what better way to start than to track my career movements and my path to get here. So beginning from a lonely graduate student in 2010, I've been doing fish telemetry and, and tracking various animals um, pretty much since then. And I've been lucky enough to go to different environments, different habitats, and different areas of the world to work with interesting animals and as well as interesting people. And because I'm the first speaker today, I thought it'd be quite important for us all to get on the same page so that you know, we can all be experts on fish tracking and particularly telemetry um, to prepare us for the, the talks that'll be after me. So my outline, as you can see here, I'm gonna start sort of so we're all um, understanding basic concepts associated with fish tracking, movements, as well as telemetry. And then I'll move on to some of my own work uh, with interactions between fishes, the environment, and humans. And then finish off uh, talking about integration of tracking research into management. So the first section, I, I've called it the W's of movement. And that's just the what's, the when's, the where's, those kind of topics. And it's really putting the importance of movements, tracking, and research into context. So we've all come to the museum today. We've all taken different paths to get here, right? So for me, I got up in a hotel, took an elevator down to the lobby, had breakfast, took an elevator up to my room, had a shower, took the elevator down to the lobby, got in a taxi, drove all the way out here, and got into the building, walked inside here, and I'm, that's where I'm here today. So that was a lot of things that just happened in that one day, and I'm sure you guys had similar mornings um, with a lot of activity. Think about your day, why don't you think about all your movements in the last week? Maybe you went to work, back and forth, back and forth, um, maybe you did groceries, um, some social calls, and sort of work your way back in time. Let's look a month ago, maybe you went on a trip somewhere else on the weekend, or let's go back over several years where maybe you moved from another city um, more vacations. And sort of the further and further we get back, we're really painting this picture of our lives, aren't we? It's really quite interesting to think about it. And not only are you, do I want you to think about where you've been, but also why you've been those places. And I've put a few examples up here of, of what, you know, maybe common things that will drive the movements that we make. And I've used gears in this animation, or this picture on purpose, because movements are really what's turning those gears that make us be capable to live the lives we do. So they allow us to achieve the things that we need to be healthy, to have fun, to be social, but also just to survive as well. And so really movement is integral for all parts of life. And surprisingly, fish are no different. They still need to meet requirements in order to survive and to thrive. They still need to move to find food to eat. They need to find mates to reproduce. Social interactions are still very important for fishes. Um, they might take huge migrations or maybe even small ones to get the resources and to fit into the environments that they need to be successful. And of course, they might need to swim to move away from predators. And so, kind of interesting when you think about the decisions that you know humans make but also fishes make every part of their lives and I would argue that a fish stepping out its doorway into the world every day is probably a lot more consequential than what we do when we step out of our day uh, our doors every day and that's because survival is going to be a huge topic for most fishes every day of their lives and they have to make decisions with that in mind so this is just a sort of a example decision framework that you know, hypothetically a fish might have to make just on a regular day um, as it wakes up from its little um, hole there in, the, in a log. And so there's a lot of factors affecting movement and what drives us to move. And this is a really nice conceptual diagram that's sort of 
kind of what we movement ecologists kind of always resort back to because it really tells the story quite well and I'll explain it to you quite briefly but there's basically arguably two main factors that will affect and drive movement of animals and so there's going to be internal factors that's that internal state on the left side and that's things like the need to eat the need to reproduce sort of keeping the internal um, physiology healthy and working and then you also have external factors that are going to influence you so things like environmental variables and changing conditions in the water or even human activities that might disrupt the habitat uh, that these fishes live in and so all these these two things really affect the trajectory or the path that an animal moves and also what limits that movement is an animal's ability to navigate through its habitat as well as to actually move through it physically and if you think about humans well we have it really quite easy don't we so Google Maps done I can get anywhere in the world I can jump on a plane I can take a train walk bicycle all these things to get where I want to go and to move in certain ways that I need to to be successful in my life fish don't really have it so easy right so they have to use what's available to them to make it through their environment and I'll just give a few examples of some movement paths that um, animals that I've studied demonstrate and so we'll have sort of a mobile generalist let's say in the top left so that would be your tiger shark it can move thousands of kilometers it doesn't really need a specific habitat it'll eat anything it comes across and so it's just moving around um, you know making decisions every day to, to suit its needs whereas you have might so have something like a stingray which I'd consider a mobile specialist so it's going to make more direct movements probably on a smaller scale as well because it needs specific habitats for it to be successful so it's probably going to be feeding in benthic areas on benthic crustaceans in, in near shore areas you also have animals like the lionfish which is invasive in the Caribbean and that's sort of a central generalist I would say because it exhibits a lot of central place fo foraging behavior sorry the pop-up and so it'll have this home uh, habitat or area that it's living in and it'll disperse to different patch reefs different reefs to exploit resources there and then will return home at the end of the day sort of thing and that's probably what humans are most similar to on, on this uh, slide and then we also have things like site specialists this would be like your reef fish that just only need a little patch to survive they spend their whole lives feeding uh, mating and avoiding predation just in a small area so that's the animal side of things um, in relation to movement but let's talk about the human side of things and, and particularly why someone like me um, studies the movement of fish and can try to rationalize to you and funders that what I do has meaning um, and probably my supervisors too would be necessary for that so first we have to think about well how about the fishes themselves what value do they have and probably not surprising they, they have quite a lot of value um, in terms of you know about 30 percent of the world readily relies on fish in their diet so it has an economic value it also has a social and cultural value in a lot of places and I was reading up on some Swedish um, customs or traditions and information and I came across something called surströmming so if people in the audience that don't know I read that it's so pungent that airlines have banned its use because it's basically a health violation and so it's uh, I think a black sea herring that's been sort of pickled in some form or fermented and yeah it can be quite um, a, a taste I'm sure but that's a prime example of a really significant cultural um, usage or, or role that fish has um, for people can also think of well, movements themselves how important are they to you know fill us in um, and make the work that we do important and so we've already kind of established that it's a fundamental part of all life movement is and so it can actually tell us quite a lot about what's going on in the life of animals and then we can think about the value of research itself um, so we're able to come in we can you know come up with hypotheses and questions and try to test those hypotheses and you know, 
simpler than what we can with telemetry itself uh, and fish tracking. We can tell where a fish is and when a fish is, and that's incredibly significant. We can also look at how animals respond to change through research, and that's, you know, with ever-increasing impacts that humans have on animals is really important. And also research is really at its heart about finding new things, novel findings. <laughs> and so research, you know, if done effectively, can build into decision-making processes such as management and spatial protection, um, like MPAs and anything like that. And, and ultimately, with that, we want to be able to sustainably manage and, and use a resource. And so that, again, loops back into the value of fishes if we're managing them correctly. So it's just this big circle. Um, so that's kind of, in my point of view, really the value of, of why we're studying fish movements. And so a final uh, slide for this section and question for this section is, how do we actually go about studying fish movements? And we're going to learn a lot about all that today. Um, for me, I've kind of categorized two main categories, sort of a biological and chemical, um, and a more physical. And so the biological chemical, in my view, is a little bit more indirect. You're sort of retroactively looking at what a fish has done using tissues um, or different samples. And so we'll have some um, really interesting talks on some genetic work that some of the individuals here are doing um, to learn more about that. And kind of, you know, one example that I'll give for everyone would be looking at the diet of, of fish. So if you, um, you know, either directly or for some biomarkers look at the diet of a fish, you can figure out where it's been based on what that prey item is, and potentially from the level of degradation of digestion, you could figure out a timeline uh, of when that animal was there. Um, so there is these kind of indirect ways to look at uh, movement. And then the, on the other side is the physical side, so a little more direct because you're actually making observations about where the animals physically are present. And so we can think of historically kind of fish tracking started when an, uh, individuals would just catch a fish, you know, stick a tag in its you know, dorsal musculature and it had that little ID on it and if we release it and someone else caught it and took down that information, well then we know it was here at this time and here at this other time. We might not know where it was in between those periods, but that was sort of the base and the start of fish tracking, really. Um, but for today, I'm going to kind of leave all those behind and really just focus on the one in orange, telemetry. So really, basically, we can think of telemetry as the tracking uh, of the movement of fish in the aquatic environment, in our case, of course, uh, using various signals. So it could be acoustic, radio, satellite, electromagnetic, or some combination uh, of those. And for the people that you know, are not familiar with this, I'm just going to walk you through it so that everyone's really at the same level of knowledge, and, and that'll be great. So really, at its base for telemetry, there's two components, and that's it. We can do a really great study with two components. Um, so maybe three if you count the fish itself. Um, but there's a transmitter. And so this is just implanted either externally or internally on the animal. It's going to send out a coded signal. And on that signal, typically it's as simple as just having an identification code that we can match up with the fish that we've actually put it in. It can be as simple as that. It can be more complicated. We can have sensors on the transmitter that might collect data in the water, log it for later. Um, but it you can still do really great work with just a, se a simple setup like that. So the first thing is a transmitter. Second thing is a receiver. So this is going to detect and record those signals that are coming from the transmitter. So it may be stationary, moored in the water. Um, it could be actually mobile as well. For example, just a satellite in space can actually be a receiver. And so it records these detections from the transmitters, and they're stored. And so we just have to access them to get that data and, and kind of do some analysis after that. And so I'll just quickly walk you through kind of a process that we might go through looking at telemetry. So in this case, we have satellite telemetry. Um, because it's connecting with space, basically, it's, it's quite a powerful device. So they're, they're typically bigger or, or quite large, you know, the size of your hand. So you really only be attaching these to larger animals, such as tuna, sharks, and other big fish. So we might catch that shark, for example. We might attach this tag to, it, you know, to its fin, whether by a, a tether or some sort of attachment method, and the shark swims off. 
And often, and there's different varieties, but often the shark will swim as it gets to the surface. Once it breaches, that signal can actually reach the satellites using radio waves, and then that satellite can log that information. Radio waves, satellite telemetry doesn't do so great in water, so that animal actually has to breach, or that tag has to be released from that animal and float up to the surface to send the information to the satellite. And so once it's in the satellite, we can download it, we can try to do some analyses, um, try to write some research papers, typically get them rejected a couple times. Eventually, maybe it gets through, we have a little celebration, because that's kind of the currency that we work in in our field. And, and hopefully, you know, that information is valuable that it can go to management and, you know, create some change or, or be applied in a certain way. So that's satellite telemetry, and, and I'll talk about that briefly, um, but my main focus today will be acoustic telemetry, and it really, at the heart, it's the exact same as a satellite. You're still going to go out and catch a fish um, and, and kind of do that whole process, but these tags can be smaller, so they typically can work with any size fish. We can put them external. Um, more and more people are putting them internally through um, sort of a simple surgical procedure. And the main difference is while that fish is swimming around in the water, it's actually transmitting that um, to a receiver in the water because it's using sound, which travels quite well in water. And so same thing, that receiver will detect that, that signal, record it, and we download it and, and try to do our best to, to make impact from it. So I was going to... Yeah, we're going to try something just to, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what to do in a sec, Gustav, but can I just quickly have about 10 people stand up right now? First 10. A couple more. Awesome. Thank you. That's great. No, too many. <laughs> okay, so let's imagine that this, this whole auditorium is a lake, all right? And let's imagine that the people that just stood up are receivers. And let's say I'm tracking a fish that we know nothing about, but we've just put it in the environment and we want to learn about it. Do you guys think that this setup of receivers would be valuable, good, bad? Yeah, so you might, yeah, I'm a little clumpy. So why don't you guys sit down and why don't 10 more stand up and try to do a nice study design, let's say, so we can get an even spread Yeah, it's a little better. So that's typically the kind of thinking that we put in. Thanks, you can sit when we do experiments because it's all about how the technology works. And so a lot of these, especially in acoustic telemetry, the receiver can only detect so far. So the, the transmitter that's you know over a kilometer away, a fish that has a transmitter, it won't be detected. It has to swim nearby. So having sort of an even distribution is quite useful. Um, we're, we're going to also try one more thing. It might not work very well. I might just get everyone to stand up because you're all going to be receivers at this point in this lake, okay? And what you're going to do is I'll get you to close your eyes. Gustav is going to be the fish with the transmitter on it. And he's going to try to move through the crowd. So just give a little bit of room for him to pass by. So that's why it might not work very well. <laughs> it's a little tight. <laughs> but... I'm going to count out. If he if taps your shoulder at a number, I want you to just remember that number. Okay? So everyone close their eyes. I've just done surgery on Gustav. I'm letting him out into the wild. All right. So no, everyone close their eyes. All right. Go for it, Gustav. So if I call out a number, he's going to tap you on the shoulder. So importantly, what species of fish? That's up to you to decide. I want to be a white shark now. Okay. <laughs> Watch out, everyone. One. If I tap them, they just no, just that's fine. <laughs> Two. <laughs> it's a slow motion. <laughs> this is the slowest white shark. <laughs> Three. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hit you really hard in the elbow. <laughs> Four. Five. 
six. Seven. <laughs> and one more, let's do eight. Okay, so everyone sit down. And so we'll stand up in order. So we'll start with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It missed. Didn't, didn't, you weren't close enough to any receiver on that one, I guess. <laughs> okay, we'll do one, one more really quick. Everyone sit down. You can just sit down and close your eyes. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> okay, that didn't work as well. He was supposed to be tapping the same person six times to show a fish that potentially had died at one location, <laughs> and he kept <laughs> moving around. <laughs> you did so well. <laughs> yeah, that was, give a, a hand for Gustav, that was really great. And, and, and thank, you, thank you for playing wrong, everyone. So, so especially that first example is really good, and that's, that's all we get back in the, in the detection data, right? We don't know where it's going between receivers or anything, so we have to put that all together. And that was a really good example of you know, where he was moving across the audience. And, and if he speeds up or slows down, sometimes it's hard to actually get that. And so the reason I brought that up is just, you know, we talk about telemetry as this really useful tool, but there's still a lot of limitations associated with it. So you know, one of them is we can only actually detect an animal that's tagged. So we actually have to put a lot of money into research in order to get these animals and, and a sample size that's effective to, to really make the study worthwhile. And similarly, we need receivers in the water too. Luckily, you guys come cheap, so that worked really well, but um, still, it's an expensive um, item. And, and the further you get away a uh, fish with a transfer from a receiver, the less likely it's get to get detected. So it, it, it influences the resolution of your study. Um, the acoustic environment or the, the aquatic environment is really loud and we're for relying on acoustic signals to move through the water for acoustic telemetry that can also be a limitation if there's boats in the water uh, loud shrimp anything like that even environmental conditions can change how we actually hear in the water so these are the things that can affect it there's also ethical considerations as well as logistic so are we actually affecting the behavior of the animal we're doing a pretty invasive surgery to sometimes? Are we actually looking at natural behavior or is it some sort of biased or affected behavior because of what we've done to this individual? And also, you know, are we actually monitoring the fish that we wanted to in the first place and is it alive? And I'll kind of leave that one as an open-ended because uh, Rob in one of our talks will really go into detail uh, about that. Okay. I don't know how much time that took to get to that, um, but <laughs> um, so that's, now I, we, we kind of have a base knowledge of telemetry, I hope, and I think we kind of get maybe the idea of it and how it can be used and how it can be useful, um, but also it's not perfect, just like anything. So now I'm going to transition to sort of my own work a little bit more and talk about the interactions between fishes, the environment, and humans, and it's really important that this kind of layout I have because it's not a one directional relationship in any way. You know, humans will affect fish, fish will affect humans. Fish will affect the environment, the environment will affect fish, and so forth. So uh, I'm going to just pull out four case studies of my own research that I've done over the years to try and at least indirectly highlight these kind of relationships. So the first one, and I'll, I'll have a lot of animations just to, to get us through, um, not be too tedious. But maybe I'll stand up here for these. So this is work I did in the Caribbean, in the US Virgin Islands, um, down here. And so we have this 
embayment that has a really nice setup of receivers. So each of those dots are a receiver that's going to listen for animals as they swim near the receivers. And typically in this area, if they're about 100 to 200 meters away from a receiver, we will get a detection. Um, it doesn't really work that much further in this environment. And for this example, uh, we're looking at the southern stingray. So this is um, a ray species. It's typically near shore. It's nocturnal, and it'll feed on benthic crustaceans. And you'll see this sort of near shore and even this benthic activity um, in this animation. That's not working. Yeah. Oh, there it's gone. Okay, so yeah, so that's just one individual. The yellows are daytime detections, the purples are nighttime. And notice that it's a little bit closer to shore at nighttime, and that's because it, when it's feeding. And so there's even from this a lot going on um, from the environment. So it, it's looking for food. It's going to be infected, affected by different temperatures in the water. It's also being affected by humans indirectly because this runway is completely artificial. Um, and it's been made. So you know, you think back, you know, 15, 20 years before when that runway wasn't there. Uh, potentially, this animal or others, you know, had a different distribution and used the environment differently. But I, I kind of highlighted this one uh, species because. It was one of those species that we could track during a huge extreme um, environmental um, disturbance. And that's because in 2017, uh, two Category 5 hurricanes came through the island two weeks apart. And it was quite significant. Um, it was really terrifying <laughs> to actually be there for it. And um, so it had a huge effect on the island itself and the people living there. Um, so this used to be my office, and this is sort of a, a view from a, a lookout, and you can see quite a difference. So can you imagine humans being affected by this, of course, with all this destruction, but imagine being a fish living in this kind of area, what that would do to you, and what, you know, the, how that could potentially not only affect you in the short term, but the long term as well. And so we actually had receivers in the water before, during, and after this hurricane. It was kind of this really unique opportunity to see how animals responded to it. So we actually had a lot of sea turtles that showed um, kind of interesting behavior. They'd all swim deeper. We'd have depth sensors on them, and just as soon as they hit, they go really deep to avoid that kind of destruction. Um, but this isn't a sea turtle conference, so um, I'm going to talk about these rays. And I'm just going to put animations for four individuals that were there that we during those times. and you'll see a date at the top, and just recall the first hurricane was September 6th, and the colors of the path of the animal will actually change, so you'll, you'll get an indication of that, but um, hopefully it works, yeah, okay, good. So blue is before, kind of that near shore behavior, and it turns yellow, that's hurricanes come through, and it's completely, all of them have changed where they typically go. Um, the top two kind of get back to where they were, but the bottom two, just completely erratic and clearly showing you know, some signs that things have changed for them. And so with these events, there is huge cold water, low oxygen profile um, movements coming into the near shore area. Uh, benthic community is going to get pretty much destroyed. There's a lot of erosion going on. So their habitat completely changed. And we actually never detected those two bottom ones ever again after that. And the top two only lasted a few more months after that. And we don't know what happened to them, but um, it's potential that they died because they just couldn't find another place suitable for them, or you know, they moved completely to a new habitat. So another case study I'll share with you is um, not too far. This is about uh, only a couple hundred kilometers south of where we just were, um, and this is uh, Nassau grouper. So many of you probably heard of this fish. It used to be sort of the iconic example of overfishing because this species um, would aggregate in large schools to the same place every time of year, so very predictable, and fishers would just come and wipe them out because they knew exactly when and where they would be. 
And so there's been a lot of work to try and get these populations back. And, and one of the ways to do this is through protected area work or, or other spatial protection. And so we have these kind of two gridded areas that are, are protection um, areas. So this one completely close to fish and this one seasonally. And, and they're there because there's these historical sites that we know they, at least in the past, used to spawn in those areas. Um, and this one particular is really still active. And so we were looking at how effective these spatial protections are. Is this you know, good enough for them? Um, and this is a huge drop off in depth. So it's a really, um, you know, a lot of flow, a lot of nutrients coming up from the depth. So it's really um, interesting uh, habitat for them to be in. So I'm gonna show another animation. This one's gonna go really quick. Uh, um, and what I have here is these are full moon periods. And it's just three different or four different months in the same year. And you'll see three different individuals move in um, quite quickly. So you can see this time bar. Yeah, so it's moving. You see the little dot moving. Once it hits about that full moon period, oh, it's not that. Sorry, guys. So about the full moon basically acts as a, a signal for them all to start migrating. And so they all kind of at the same time every year with that new moon just are flying into that spawning area to reproduce. And <laughs> and so what happened is we, we looked at these movements of what areas they were using and and from that, we can actually, we determined that as good as this area was to protect them, it wasn't really utilized as well as it, it could have been. And, and these kind of areas out here were still getting a lot of activity from the fish and still being exposed potentially to overfishing um, outside these protected areas. So this is a, a case where, you know, we've submitted to management to kind of expand the, uh, that protected area for them. So another case study is um, we're bringing in North America and the Great Lakes, the freshwater, and specifically looking at walleye. So this is a huge fishery species in Canada in the Great Lakes, probably the top one in the Great Lakes. And it's really interesting because there's Canada and USA, and then there's also four states in the USA that all have different sort of managerial uh, approaches for this one big population of walleye. So you can imagine how hard it is to manage you know, this whole, this huge area across different countries and states. And there's actually a commercial fishery in Canada, and it's a recreational fishery in America, so it's really quite complex. And really, the Great Lakes have done a, an incredible job at managing it, and they're, they're kind of one of the prime examples of um, where management and research kind of get along to make um, effective decisions. Um, but the walleye population is really interesting because there's also uh, a bunch of different spawning stocks as well. So all these stars are different uh, stocks of the same species, but they'll all reproduce in the same location. So they'll swim out, but they'll always come back to that same area to spawn. And so we have on this western side quite shallow. This gets quite warm in the summer. And you'll see in the next animation a lot of the fish moving out of here as the summer, as the water basically gets too warm because it's so shallow, and utilizing these deeper, cooler, more productive waters in the summertime. But just before that, to highlight how important this fishery is, those are numbers of regulation size fish that can be caught in a fishery. There's over 100 million in some years. So that's you know incredible amount of fish. And quotas are typically around 20 million. So in, this in a year, they might be bringing in 20 million fish um, in this fishery. So it's really quite substantial. Um, and they every year try to you know adjust the, the, the allowable catch to match sort of the needs uh, of the people, but also what the fish are actually doing in terms of abundance. So it's kind of going up and down. In the last few years, it's really been a, a productive um, you know, population, but we still have concerns because you can look at this sort of decrease in size across all age groups in these last years. Even though there's a lot of productivity, the size classes are decreasing, and that's always a concern when we see those kind of movements, thinking about top-down kind of effects that we have or fishing down the food web. So we were brought in to kind of look at, you know, 
the vulnerability of different stocks at different times of year. And, and this animation, hopefully it runs all right. Uh, it might be a little bit too much, but the black dots represent where the receivers are. And you can see that they're changing because the receivers are coming in and being removed throughout the years. And, and soon they'll get added more and more. And from that, just like we saw in that little experiment, we can start tracking their movements a little bit more effectively. And so the different colors are those different spawning stocks. And so every summer, uh, they're moving out to the east side, and then at the end of summer, they're coming back to spawn on the west side. And so it'll about to pick up. So you can imagine how complicated it is to manage different stocks of this species across different countries and states. It looks a lot more impressive when it's going at full speed. I apologize. But basically our role was to provide sort of that information to managers so that they can make the best decisions they have. And so just here, just showing how that cyclical pattern of moving back and forth between the East and Western basin um, occurs. And so that's all these Western stocks doing similar things in and out, in and out. And then the Eastern stocks actually just kind of staying on the Eastern side more. Um, so not as exposed to some of the fishery that's really heavily um, focused in this area. And so if this is my final case study for this section is, is looking at some work that I'm doing now on tiger sharks in Norfolk Island out in the Pacific here. And so this is where we're tagging them. And, and these sharks that I'll show you in this animation have satellite tags on them. So we're only getting detections when they come to the surface. And so that does limit it what we can get from them, but we can still use a few tricks to kind of get their movement paths. So again, we'll see how choppy this is, but yeah. But basically you can see that they're coming from Norfolk Island where they're tagging them. There's a lot of movement up here, and that's New Caledonia, a French territory up in here. And then a lot of them still come back down here. And so typically around November, October, they come back to Norfolk, and then they're there for six months, and then they depart. And a lot go to New Cal, but you still get movements all over the place. And so this is Norfolk. This is where we were tagging these, these fish. And it's a small island. It's only about five kilometers across, really in the middle of the Pacific. And it's become this really interesting tourist place because there's a lot of history um, there. But one of the unique things about it is that it is um, kind of hosts one of the largest aggregations of tiger sharks in the world that come there seasonally um, to visit. And, and what makes it even more interesting is that um, Norfolk Island is filled with these guys. And I never thought I'd give a talk about fish and have a cow as a slide, but there you go. Because it, it really creates a really interesting dynamic interaction because this, this island is really small. It's not good for agriculture, so they bring in cows. Um, and so there's big cattle industry there. And on a five kilometer squared island, what do you do with the leftovers from all the cows that either you butcher or you die? And you can probably guess where this is going a little bit. But historically, the butchers will just dump the carcasses, the guts, any sort of offal into the water off this chute on the eastern side of the bay just here. And when you do that around a population, the largest tiger, tiger shark population in the world, um, you can imagine that they're going to be interested in that area, right? And so they often see sharks hanging around that area. And, and it's sort of a chicken and egg situation, but um, it's problematic for a couple of reasons. But f f most of all, this is actually a marine park, this whole area. And there's a lot of international accords that don't really like the idea of marine pollution going in the ocean. So um, Australian Marine Parks is really trying to limit the butchers from you know, discarding of their, their offal into the water. Um, but the, the, the really interesting thing is that the butchers actually think they're kind of doing a service to the community because there is surf, be there's surf, there's beaches, only about a couple of kilometers from this, this area where they, they dump off the offal. And the butchers actually think that they're doing a service to the community because if they're not putting the, the food into the water, well then the sharks might go look somewhere else for that food and potentially find people at the beach. So it's a really interesting kind of social, ecological um, interaction going on there. And so our work is to try and you know, see if 
the sharks are actually really reliant on that area and what they're doing when there's not disposal going on. And so we've doing work with acoustic telemetry around the island, and those are all receivers that we have exposed, um, uh, deployed around the island. And we're catching big, big sharks. These are four meters or more female tiger sharks. They're huge. Um, and so we're kind of looking, working with the community, try and get information about when disposal are happening to, to def, you know, determine what the effect is. A and I'll just kind of let you guys decide what you think is going on um, from this animation. And so it's going to go pretty quick. So all those dots are sharks moving. In the yellow, it's the number of sharks that day that are detected in that area where that shoot is, which is around here. And then when the red blip comes up, that means on that day, the butchers put something off onto the side. And so you can kind of count, well, is there more sharks happening when there's disposal periods? I mean, f it's very obvious that this area is important to the sharks, right? They're, they're definitely there more than anywhere else on the island. But I would probably at least initially argue that they're there independent of the disposal periods, right? Um, and so this project's kind of ongoing, and there's certainly other um, reasons that they could be there. Um, there might be more current. There's actually a lot of bird population nestings along here, and tiger sharks will kind of eat anything they can get their hands on. So part of it is thinking that they might just be hanging out here to, to catch birds that are sitting on the water when they're unsuspecting. But that's sort of ongoing work that we have, um, which is really quite cool. And so just, you can look at the hotspot areas of where the sharks are during disposal and non-disposal periods, and they look pretty even throughout. How much? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so it depends what parts. So some, uh, there's different parts of the cow, they'll dispose more than others. So the hides um, they'll, and the bones, they'll dispose at least once a week or so. Um, and the, the big challenge is actually working with the community to make sure that they're giving us the proper information of when they're actually doing this. Because um, if we don't have that, then it, it sort of goes out of whack. What's um, so I, I did have a few more slides, so we'll see how we go. Um, this last section is really about um, looking at how we can integrate some of the research we're doing with, um, with tracking itself. And, and these are kind of examples of, of what we've come across you know, how they relate to management and the work that I just showed in those, those four um, example uh, case studies. And ultimately, we really want to, you know, have our work go into management, and that doesn't always happen and, and doesn't always need to, but um, typically we want the work that we're doing to have application and to, to kind of help a greater good. And so my focus has really been acoustic telemetry, and, and you can see how much it's blown up and where it's kind of been um, focused on throughout the world. And one of the great things about it is because we can learn so much about the movements, um, they can actually look at a lot of things that are relevant to management through acoustic telemetry. And, and these are sort of the main things that I've pulled out or my team's pulled out of the literature. We've looked through about a thousand different articles to pull out you know, what research is actually fo focusing on in terms of these areas that are relevant to management. A and we can get the proportion of, of where studies are focusing their efforts throughout the world. Um, but I just thought I'd focus on Europe here quickly in freshwater and marine environments. And you can see um, how important different categories are for research. And if we look at the species as well, it's not surprising we see a lot of salmon and eel work going on with migrations and impediments. <coughs> you know, impediments here meaning barriers to movement like dams. Um, but we can really get an idea of where the research is being prioritized, but also where maybe there's gaps in research that need to be focused on in the future. And so just the last few slides, um, we started pulling in all these uh, different um, information from the literature, and that's sort of building up a database of, of kind of interesting things that we could build on. And so that's kind of a project that we just started up called TrackDat, where we're actually housing and storing uh, important metadata from all the acoustic telemetry um, papers out in the literature. And, and from that, we were taking out a bunch of different information. We're actually utilizing fish based to get a lot of the sort of species information that might be informative to r different researchers or different stakeholders. A and that's sort of in beta uh, about to be released. And I thought I'd, instead of going through the website itself, I'd just pull out a few pages from it. So I decided to look at Sweden. Um, what work's been going on in Sweden with acoustic telemetry. Found about 15 publications, which means that 
there's about 14 countries doing more, having more publications above Sweden, so it's not too bad. Um, but you can look at all the species that have been focused on for the research, and I noticed a, f uh, a name kept coming up. Uh, he had one more, that, yeah, there's another one down here, not getting highlighted. So I, I decided to put Gustav under the, the, line, the light here and clicked on his name to see what he's been up to. And this is embarrassing, man. You should stop this. <laughs> your out he's your got time is up. Nine publications. <laughs> and these are the species that he's worked on. Um, and then I can even click on sort of one study, for example, um, looking at data loggers. Um, you're Swedish, right? Yep. Are you allowed to work in Denmark? Ah, uh, or <laughs> special permission. <for me>. But, <laughs> but they tagged 66 eels, and, and there's all this other information on the website that we can pull out that kind of informs uh, the work that's been doing there. And so really the goal of, of this, this effort is to kind of create a global community where we have all these resources in one location. Um, someone can, a new student can go search, okay, what's been done on this sp species that's part of my, my thesis? Um, we want to get greater engagement with management and researchers, and I think this could be a useful way to do it. And basically, you know, try to reduce any barriers between management and research and, and sort of expand on our, our knowledge base in this realm. So yeah, it's, it's in beta right now. Uh, feel free to, if you are interested in that QR code, you can have a look at, uh, get on our list and I'll update you. But I also have my laptop on me if you ever want to have a look. Um, I can walk you through our, our database in, in beta right now. Um, but yeah, with that, uh, sorry this has gone um, a little kinks and I've gone over time. But um, thanks again so much everyone and, and Fishbase. And, and this has been a really great trip. And I'll just finish with a video um, I, I put in my abstract what happens when a shark meets a cow. I don't know if anyone saw that, um, but that's, this is the answer to it. They just walk hand in hand together. That's, that's the answer. Amazing, really great stuff. Tiger sharks eating cows. That's, we have similar problems up in Umeå as well. So <laughs> we're working on that. So uh, we're a bit over time here, but I think we can squeeze in one or two questions perhaps. If there's one. Uh, hi there. So my name is Nikki Sprong. I'm from the Fisheries Secretariat, which is an NGO secretariat, so I'm not really involved with direct science anymore. But uh, I wanted to ask a quite a basic question about the, you know, the tracking and the general movement categories that you showed in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering about, you know, fishes that move more in big shoals, because mm -hmm. the the different categories of general migration or whatever that they, they seem to be. I know they move in groups, but it, it was not quite that. that I was thinking about fish that move in really big shoals. So do you, how would you char characterize their movements? A lot of them do like seasonal migrations. Uh, and would telemetry uh, be a natural tool for tracking them as well? Or would you use other methods of tracking their movements? Yeah, so you mean in terms of the categorization of the, those, those migrations? Yeah, so w we looked at migration as, as sort of having a, a, a biological role. So if it, if it was a large migration for um, reproduction or if it was a small movement for reproduction, that's still a, a migration on, on certain scales. So um, a lot of subjectivity on how you um, define those things. Um, and, and in those categories, one of more, you know, more migration versus more studies on migration versus more studies on um, MPAs or protected areas doesn't mean that one's better than the other or it's, it's more effective than the other in forming management. Um, not sure if I'm getting at directly the question, but uh, in terms of tracking shoals, um, I guess it depends on how big are the fish. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, 
acoustic telemetry especially is, is you know, you can tag things that are, that are tiny. And, and we've tagged forage, forage fish, um, yeah, under 10 centimeters. I've worked with invasive gobies that are, you know, tiny and it sort of gets to a point where can you do it? But um, acoustic typically would be the best for that kind of thing. If, if it's, um, if you know the areas where they could be coming from, especially from river mouths or anything like that, it's, it's always, yeah, if you know kind of hotspot areas, but a lot of it is, you know, until we have that knowledge, it's sort of, you know, you do your best and put a lot of equipment out and, um, you know, things, you can always rely on, on sort of fishery knowledge, uh, actual from fishers or indigenous cultures often have insight that you might not, and that's kind of important too to, you know, fill the gaps. Mm. Yeah, certainly. And then that's sort of the Lake Erie and the Great Lakes. It's it's actually completely covered now. They're a kilometer or so apart now. So they whole coverage, they basically know what's going on in that lake if an animal's tagged. But it didn't start that way, and they, they certainly didn't know um, where everything was going at the time. And now they're just kind of building that into their knowledge base, yeah. All right, maybe we don't have time for sure. another yeah. question. Or <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks again. Thank you so much.